Please give a big Mad Monster Party 2024 welcome to Kane! Oh, hey, thank you guys uh, so very much. And also thank you to the folks that put this on, the Mad Monster people, Mad Monster Party people. This has been a lot of fun. So let's give them a round of applause, please. Cool, all right. We're going to go ahead and open up some audience questions. So if anyone has a question, raise your hand up nice and high so we can see you. We'll bring the microphone over. I can't see you, so you can ask anything, all right? Oh, thank you. So um, over the years, you've had, like, some pretty, you know, unique characters. Um, What was the moment for you that you realized that, you know, a cane was going to be the one of all the other characters? That was... Very nicely how you said that I've had some unique characters. So, uh, and a couple, frankly, failures. And uh, when they were talking to me about the Kane character, I immediately knew that it was a big deal because you're in a storyline with The Undertaker, which is as high as you can go. So I just pretty much automatically was like, this is a big deal. Originally, the character was only supposed to be a one-off. It was supposed to be a hot shot. What had happened was when Vader was arrested in Kuwait, he was in storyline with Undertaker. So they needed someone for Mark to work with or to wrestle against at an upcoming pay-per-view. And they figured, okay, we have Glenn. He's a big guy. We'll just throw a mask on him, and uh, that'll be that. But Vince liked once the storyline started getting fleshed out, he liked that so much that he realized that the character Kane had legs outside of just all of a sudden the Undertaker's long lost brother pops up and they have one match and that's it. Uh, so they go into this whole storyline arc, uh, which I think is unmatched in the history of professional wrestling. I think as far as what I'll call epic storytelling, like mythology and, you know, these big, long story arcs, it, it, there's nothing that's ever been, I don't think, compares to the undertaker Kane storyline. So it was pretty much right off the bat that I knew there was going to be a big deal. Then you fast forward to the debut at In Your House, Bad Blood, the Hell in a Cell match between Undertaker and Shawn Michaels, and I'll never forget that. And I come walking out, first time that the public had ever seen Kane, and... You know, they have the, the um, concussion and then the music and the lights are out and then they come back on and there I am. And for however long, 15 or 30 seconds, it's like there was a silence in the arena because no one knew what was going on. And then you have, of course, people think it was Jim Ross doing that's got to be Kane. It was actually Vince. But, you know, you have him on TV doing that, but then like the live the live audience figured it out, right? And it was just boom, it was just this ginormous reaction. Um, So I knew then too, I was like, oh, this is gonna be a big deal. Uh, And there was frankly a lot of pressure because if that hadn't come off, I certainly wouldn't be up on this stage here today. I'd have been back back home wondering what I was gonna do next in my life. So that was a great question, thank you. How you doing, sir? Uh, If you could have one dream match with any past superstars living or passed away, who would it be? Andre the Giant. I never met him. He passed away right when I was getting into the wrestling business, so I never met him. When I was a little kid, I remember, remember Sports Illustrated had that big story about him, and I think the author was Frank DeFord, who was a well-known sports writer, and they got that picture of they're both holding beer cans like that, right? And it looks like Andre's is a little toy because his hand completely engulfs the entire beer can. Whereas the normal sized dude, (laughs) it looks like a beer can. Um, So yeah, it would have been Andre because he was just so unique and um, I just never met him. Hi, brother. Again, I can't see you, sorry. It's mini cane. The dryer version. Okay, gotcha. Hey, what's up, man? What's up? I got a two-part question, man. 
First one is, what was your re uh, initial reaction to them telling you you were actually going to be set on fire in an Inferno match? Yeah. What was my initial reaction? Yeah. I'm going to win the match. <laughs> I was very motivated. <laughs> uh, but a uh, funny story about that is, of course, that was the same night that Mick Foley, his mankind, got chokeslammed or thrown off the cage and chokeslammed through the cage. And I'm still a little hot because no one remembers that I won my first world championship that night because him, right? Um, but, but in any case, when the uh, off the top of the cage deal, that was part of it, the through the cage deal was not. Uh, the cage literally broke. And we all were like, oh, Mick is probably very seriously hurt. And um, so... And Mick goes on at the match. He's an incredibly tough guy. But, I mean, you could tell he was, he was all wobbly and everything. And, and Vince McMahon, or sitting in was called the gorilla position, which is where you go out to the ring. And Vince McMahon looks at me, and I, in, in that match, at the end of the first blood match, Undertaker comes out, and Mick comes out, and, and uh, Undertaker is trying to hit Mick with the chair and ends up hitting Austin out in the match. Vince looks at me and he's like, you know, if Mick can't go back out there, you're going to have to figure out what to do. And I'm like, me? Well, you got all these riders around you and I guarantee you one thing ain't going to happen is I'm not going to cover myself in gasoline and set myself on fire. So, but luckily he was able to get back out there. Um, you know, and then we had the Inferno match with Undertaker. That was in Greensboro right down the road. Uh, and that was, that's one of my favorite matches as well. Um, that was also a little hairy because it would, it was so hot in the ring and you couldn't really get too close uh, to the flames because it was, it, it was very, very warm. But um, yeah, my safety was a priority, so I really don't want to set myself on fire. So what was your next question? Uh, this one's actually from my mom. Can I borrow one of the tables up there? She said she wants to be choke slammed. <laughs> Did you say that about your, your mom? That's not She right, wants dude. to be choke slammed. Oh, okay. Well, all right. She has to sign a waiver. So. All right. Thank you. Hi. I just wanted to ask, uh, what's your favorite memory of uh, working with Paul Bearer? So one time we were pulling into the San Diego sports arena, and Paul had said that he wasn't feeling well. This is when I first started as Kane. So I would always wear a towel over my head or I'd wear a mask. And this is also before the internet. I guess you know, the internet was kind of taking off, but um, you know, you still had kayfabe, right? Uh, so anyway, so I didn't want people to actually see my face. So I would always wear something over it. So um, Paul said he wasn't feeling well, asked if I could drive to the building and uh, we we're pulling up to the arena and the configuration there is unique because you would pull down into the arena, but you have several thousand fans standing watching you pull in, right? So we had like a red Cadillac to, you know, you couldn't, couldn't miss us, right? Um, anyway, so we're, I'm driving, we we're pulling in and Paul Bearer, who was so sick that he couldn't drive and was just like laying next to me limp his head against the window, all of a sudden makes this miraculous recovery, rolls down the window and says, it's a miracle. Kane can drive. Kane can drive. <laughs> you have all these, you know, I was just like, mm, never again. So uh, Paul, was, Paul was a great ribber. And uh, luckily I wasn't, you know, the ones with me were rather innocent like that. Um, but it was always something with him and then of course I'm not actually a ribber but I never felt bad when I got him because he got me a lot on stuff. So in 2017 I moved to Knoxville and I started seeing signs Glenn Jacobs for mayor and I was like the only Glenn Jacobs I know is the big red machine. So my question is what was the transition like for you switching from a physical sport to politics? Well, politics is a physical sport. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, and people kind of look at me weird when I say this, but there, there are really a lot of similarities, not obviously with what you do in the ring, but still behind the scenes. And the, it's still a team game, right, with professional wrestling. 
And a lot of the reason that we were so successful during the Attitude Era is because you, you had some tremendous stars, but everybody got along pretty well. And the main thing was ensuring that you were putting forth the best product that you possibly could. Uh, and that actually involves politics, right, uh, in, in that in that regard. So it wasn't as different as people might think. Also, I was very fortunate because through WWE I'd had like a lot of media trainings. I know how to, I know how to address that. I know also in, interactions with the public. Maybe the most important thing is because I'm used to being in the spotlight, albeit in a slightly different way, but that doesn't freak me out. And a lot of folks, they get into politics, oh my God, the newspaper wrote something about me. I'm like, Phew. They write bad stuff about me all the time, you know, and you can't worry about it. Um, and a lot of it, it it's, it's literally, sadly, but it's almost the same in that, you know, people are reacting to a persona. Like, the folks that have never met me and, oh, he's a terrible person. I'm like, well, that's great. You've never even said two words to me. You have no idea. Um, and the reason I say that is because I have a certain persona politically, right? And it's almost, I mean, it's so much the same stuff. Uh, and, and anyway, but, you know, I always tell young people, the things that make you successful in one thing as far as soft skills, they'll make you successful in other stuff as well. So even though it's different, it's the same. And some of this stuff too, man, you know, I watch the news and I'm like, that's, it's almost like wrestling and I don't want to make light of things. Uh, but, you know, sometimes it feels like, you know, people are concentrating on an issue and what they're really trying to do is gain a political advantage by doing that. And the same thing we do in wrestling. So there are some similarities for sure. Thank you. Hey, I was wondering, are you a horror fan? And uh, if so, did that influence the character of Kane at all and how you portrayed that, that character through the years? Yeah, I, I am. Uh, uh, not so much nowadays, but I was. And yes, for me, the, uh, you know, Undertaker's the same way. I mean, he get the, the sit up was, I mean, that's a horror movie thing, right? The, the movie monster does a sit up and so much of his character was based around like kind of the Michael Myers stuff. Um, so same with me, especially when we transitioned, when I took the mask off, all right? And people will say, well, we figured your face would be all burnt up because that was a storyline. Well, the only time I really talked about this on screen uh, was when I had the, the uh, I set JR on fire, which he was, he had new barbecue sauce out, by the way, so I was really trying to promote that. <laughs> but the thing was, if, if you've, uh, if you've watched Red Dragon or read the book, which is by Thomas Harris, and it is a, uh, um, it's after Lord of the Rings, it's a sequel to Lord of the Rings, uh, not Lord of the Rings, I'm sorry, um, Silence of the Lambs, thank you. Yes, sorry, wrong, wrong genre. Um, yeah, I know. But in any case, uh, but the antagonist in Red Dragon in the book is this big, huge guy, and when he was a little kid, he had a hair lip, okay? He had a cleft palate. And he, he, his, he was, I think he was born out of wedlock, so he ends up, his grandmother raises him, and she considers him a sin. He's an abomination. Um, but he, he gets the cleft palate fixed, and as an adult, he always has a mustache, so you can't even see it. But because of experience and, and the abuse that he suffered at the hands of his grandma, he believes he's a monster. And that's where the red dragon comes in. Like he's weak, um, you know, and all these things, but the red dragon, his alter ego is powerful, right? And I took that and that's kind of when we took the mask off, Cain became much more of a psychological monster, okay? He went from being a physical monster now uh, to the scars. He was never burnt in a fire, it was all up here which to me is much more frightening than if he'd actually been physically harmed and deformed, right? Someone that thinks that they're a monster on the inside, 
that's really, really scary. But the only time, because things go so fast and quickly in WWE, the only time I really got to talk about it was that interview. But certainly, you know, there are elements, and not only from, um, not only from horror, but also even from Shakespeare and classical literature um, that we would kind of try to uh, intertwine into the character.